Hi folks, and welcome to Open Analysis Live. We're back. So today we're gonna to be talking about sinkholes. Wrong kind of sinkhole. So today we're gonna to be talking about sinkholes, what they are, how to do it legally and safely, and we're gonna demonstrate by actually sinkholing this USB worm that has been around for 10 years that uses an IRC protocol. So we're actually gonna build a sinkhole for it, deploy it, and stay tuned because it's kind of crazy uh, what we see at the end. So this is the last episode in our series we've been doing on this malware. I'll link the earlier videos in the description of this video below. You should definitely check them out because all of those lead up to today. So we've tried to show you the full reverse engineering process, right from decrypting strings, uh, resolving imports, then marking up our IDB, and then finally today we figure out what it does and then we build a sinkhole for it. So the whole process we've captured in a series of videos and this is the final one. So before we jump into it, as always, a word from our sponsors, which is us over at Unpack Me, a malware unpacking service from Open Analysis. Expose the malware before it exposes you. If you haven't checked it out and you want to unpack some malware, head on over there. It's free and hopefully it's a useful service for you guys. So uh, without further ado, let's jump in here. So in our last video, we showed how to mark up our IDB. We figured out what all these functions do. And now we're gonna go and we're gonna take a quick look at the overall program flow. Just so we have a reminder or fresher of what we're looking at here. So this is injected uh, into explorer.exe. And when it's run, the first thing it does is it checks for a mutex uh, to make sure that it's the only thing running on the box, I make sure there's not two versions of it running. If the mutex times out, uh, it'll actually exit the thread. So it has to be the only thing with that mutex set uh, on the host. Then it decrypts the injected strings. Again, we showed in the last video how this malware, in addition to injecting this code into explorer.exe, it also injects a struct, which has uh, functions, strings tables, and some pointers to some of its own functions. So the next thing it does is it makes a copy of itself to the C directory uh, with these directories submarine. I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, they, they call the exe yellow, so like yellow submarine, I guess it's some trolley thing. Um, so they, they make a copy of themselves, again, very common for malware. The next thing they do is they create a thread which tries to set the run key. And this is set obviously in like software, Microsoft Windows current version run, right? The standard run key that we see. And the uh, key name that they use is <laughs> a little dicey here, Shemail Biz. Again, these guys definitely troll in here, uh, kind of weird. So they set that run key. Let's pop back here. So after they set the run key, they start another thread, uh, which is kind of interesting. It looks for any removable drives that are added to the host, and it makes a copy of this malware to those removable drives with an, an init file, basically an auto run file, so that when that uh, USB is then plugged into another host, which is vulnerable to the auto run uh, file, it'll actually execute that malware. So uh, this always runs in the background, just waiting for somebody to plug in a USB key. And if we take a look at it here, um, it's pretty simple. It's just the thread that's running here and uh, it's getting all the logical drives, uh, checking for a removable one, and then it copies over the auto run uh, .ini. But what's interesting about this is it'll also check to see whether there is an open IRC connection and it'll send this uh, this funny sort of message, uh, private message to the IRC host, stealth USB, and then the uh, drive string that it's actually infected. So it's they kind of keep like a running tab of all the different uh, portable drives that they've infected. Again, if they're connected to IRC uh, when the USB is plugged in. So kind of interesting. Another, again, this is the worm component of this malware. So another uh, important part of the, com of, of the malware. And then uh, the last thing, the part that we're gonna focus on today, is how they set up that command and control channel to the IRC server and what commands they send and receive. So here we can see there's this big while loop um, which just keeps on running every 10 seconds. And there's three command and control domains. So these are three domains that they try to connect to in order. You know, if it fails, they just, oh, there's the third one. If it fails, they just try the next one. What they do is they try and connect to the domain and then they send this initialization command set. So they send, first of all, 
the uh, nick, so this would be like the nickname on the server, uh, which is virus dash a randomly generated string, which they uh, generate, and they send along a username and password for uh, that server uh, when, when they first connect to it. So after they connect to it, this is kind of weird, the program flow. For these two domains, they receive commands immediately. For uh, the first domain, they actually break out of this while loop and they receive commands here, but it's the same receive commands uh, function. So it's the same way, it's just, it's just a different way of uh, organizing it. So in the receive commands, so this is after they sent that initial password with the nick and the username, they send a, so they receive this, they receive whatever is sent back from the IRC server, and then they parse it and they send this initial, initialization message. And so what are they parsing for? Well, they're looking for a uh, message of the day, which is like a standard sort of banner that can be sent by the IRC server. So once they check for the message of the day, they actually send, they build this command here where they send a join to uh, a private chat called, or a channel, sorry, called Stealth. <laughs> and uh, so they attempt to join a channel called Stealth. After they uh, send that command and they ostensibly join the channel, they listen for a series of commands here. So these would be commands in the open channel that they respond to. If they get a ping, they send a pong. These are just standard IRC commands. They check for things like if the nickname they chose is already in use, they try and choose a new one if it is. But what they're really looking for is they're looking to do private messages because that's how they actually control the bot. So they're looking for a private message command, in which case they, uh, they're they looking for this particular string, Rock and Rio. And when they get that, they They'll open a private message chat, here we go, and then they receive the actual commands for the bot. Now there's a lot of sort of standard commands in here, um, which we've uh, deobfuscated and sort of marked up. But, uh, so these would be things like, uh, you know, reconnect or join a channel or part, so leave the channel, stuff like that. But the important commands uh, are these sort of strange ones here. So they have a reconnect command. Uh, I'm not really sure, I didn't look too closely. I was going a little bit quick to see there's R as a reconnect, also QGRR is reconnect. I I'm not really sure <laughs> um, what's going on here. But again, not too, too important. Um, the important ones are this uh, Cosimo Yad, um, which means uh, delete the malware and exit. So that means that's basically like a remove yourself command. Uh, I'll talk about this in a minute when we talk about sinkholing. Uh, then we also have another uh, very important command here, nasal ghost which I think is really the core component of this worm. And that is where the operator can uh, send a binary, which is downloaded and then executed on the host. So all of this uh, stuff, the, spread, the USB spreading, the IRC channel connections, all of that, it looks like it's all one just large way to spread malware. And the real command here is this nasal ghost, where basically this infection, this infected host will call in and then you can send uh, whatever malware you want to the host. And again, they're also keeping track of each USB that they infect. So you can see that nowadays those auto run stuff, most hosts won't auto run from a USB. Um, but back in the day when this was, you know, 10 years ago, uh, this would have been a pretty effective way to infect a lot of hosts. Uh, and I'm not really sure what this was used for. Uh, it's really trolly, like I say. Um, it looks like, uh, you know, it could either be some sort of script kitty thing, uh, or it could be something where people were actually looking for a certain host to target. Uh, something kind of interesting here is we know that the developers, or we suspect, I guess, the developers were uh, Arab speaking because because if we come into uh, Google Translate and we put in uh, nasal, uh, we can see that it roughly translates to coming down or download. And this is download ghost, which would be like a stealth download. Uh, we can kind of infer this. And a little bit more solid relation to the fact that these uh, people probably spoke Arabic is this <laughs> Kosumiyak YID, um, which is very, very rude. <laughs> thing to say. So uh, if we break this out into Kos Amak, uh, Amiak, I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't speak Arabic, um, but I know that that doesn't mean your mom's bracket. That means something else pretty rude. And Yad is like a, a slang for go away or get lost. So it's kind of like uh, a rough translation of 
fuck off. <laughs> so basically, if you put this all together, anyone who speaks Arabic, feel free to correct me in the comments. Uh, this is just kind of what I inferred from this command. And again, this isn't like any sort of attribution. Uh, this is just something that I would note in my malware notes is that, you know, these commands appear to be slang in uh, in Arabic. But who knows, right? This is has nothing to do with attribution. So anyway, that's an important command, the nozzle ghost thing. And of course, which is also the download and execute. So that kind of makes sense in the context. And this cos omyak yad or whatever is where they delete and exit. So that kind of makes sense for fuck off. So, <laughs> so it kind of makes sense here. So now that we're familiar with these commands, what I want to do is I want to introduce you to a really nice tool from uh, FireEye, which is basically a traffic interceptor. So let's pop over to our VM here. Uh, this is where we have the sample. So this thing's called FakeNet. I'll link it in the description uh, of the video below. And what it does is it basically just diverts all traffic to a bunch of fake listeners. Uh, so it has ones for like IRC, HTTP, HTTPS, et cetera, et cetera. And it just captures captures all that traffic and then prints out a, a log of what, what it sees. So this is actually really helpful if you're doing triage, but since we already know what to expect, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run it just to prove to you that our static analysis is, uh, is complete. One thing about this is you have to have your network settings on uh, in order for it to work. So I'll just run it here. Uh, we can see it's running. So there's gonna be a bunch of uh, garbage going on in the background, just Windows stuff. Uh, you can actually filter this out in the config. Uh, I'm just being lazy. So you can you can tell it just to listen for certain things. What we wanna see is we wanna actually see it, see some IRC traffic. So if we run a sample.exe, and then we'll look locally here to see whether uh, in a minute or two, because it has to inject into uh, explorer.exe, we'll wait and see whether we see some, oh yeah, here we go. Uh, so we can see there's an IRC connection uh, what did they do when they first connected to it here? They issued an unknown command, so it wasn't implemented in FakeNet for a uh, pass virus. So just like I said, they're trying to authenticate with password virus to the channel. And then what do they do? They try and join the channel stealth with this virus with the randomly generated string on the end of it. So our static analysis is validated. Uh, we can see that this is actually what the malware is doing when it tries to connect to IRC. So that brings us to our final point here, which is that we can sync all these. So let's take a look here. I'll actually kill this first. So let's take a look at the domains here. Okay, so what's interesting about these is these are dynamic DNS domains and they're available. So what dynamic DNS is, is you can register these domains and point them to your home IP and you don't have to worry about setting up DNS or anything like that. And it's sort of like a way to basically get your home IP on the internet. It's used for other stuff now. And it used to be really popular with malware, less so now because a lot of organizations block this because it's just usually bad news in an organization. But basically these are all dynamic DNS, uh, or the, at least these two are dynamic DNS domains and they're available. So what we can do is we can create what's called a sinkhole. We basically register these domains and we put an IRC listener on the, po on the port that we expect them to connect to. But here's the important part. In order to stay on the right side of the law, we don't wanna send any information to that bot. Um, you're certainly gonna be crossing lines uh, if you send anything back. So all we wanna do is just log the connection so that we can gather information about who's connecting in. And basically that's it. We just register the domain, log the connections, um, and then we might gather some information about is the botnet still active? And where is it active? Is it active in certain locations? Now, I feel a little bit strange about putting this out as a YouTube video, um, just because this is something that is sometimes frowned upon when independent researchers do it. I really don't see the problem with sinkholing a 10 year old USB spreading botnet that basically the vulnerability has been patched a long time ago that it exploits. I would say there's a lot of caution here if it's modern malware. Usually you'd wanna work with an organization to do this. The one that we recommend is Shouter Server. I will link them down below. If you're gonna work with something that isn't a 10 year old USB spreading botnet, you probably wanna to talk to somebody who knows what they're doing uh, before you do anything like this. Warning. The stunts in this movie were performed by professionals, so for your safety and the protection of those around you, do not attempt any of the stunts you're about to see. Warning, caveat, whatever you want to say, that, that, that's my piece here. Uh, you can do whatever you want as long as you stay on the right side of the law, but that's just the recommendation I have. Okay, so what we did was we went and registered those domains, and we pulled up uh, one of our servers here, which has uh, internet access, and we basically took the IRC 
Python listener from FakeNet, which is an open source project and it's written in Python. Uh, you just saw me run the compiled exe version of, of the Python tool. So what we did was we took the IRC listener and we removed any sort of command responses or anything like that to make sure that we weren't going to cause any damage in case there was a bot out there. Uh, again, you wanna be really careful about not sending any commands uh, if you're gonna do something like this. So all we do is we just allow the TCP socket to open and anything they send to us, we take and then we close it, that's it. So anything they wanna to send to us on that socket, we'll receive it, but we're not gonna send anything back. So we set this up on our server and we pointed those domains to the server and I'll let you uh, take a look at, uh, at what happened. So let's run this uh, python irc.py and we already get connections. So now normally this would show the IP address of the connection, but I censored it out because we don't want to go exposing people who might be infected, but we can see that these people are issuing these commands. So they are definitely the, the virus, uh, people who are infected with this virus uh, connecting in and issuing these commands. And you can see it's, it's pretty active. It's in fact, it's so active that when I uh, set this up initially, I thought this was going to be an interesting learning experience. And what I plan to do was I plan to run the uh, bot from my VM and show it connecting into the sinkhole. What happened though, is as soon as I set this up, uh, I just, I just ended up getting a ton of these messages. So I had to redirect the uh, sinkhole to localhost so that uh, it wasn't connecting out. And I'll, I'll be following up with this through like a proper notification process in order to get these people notified um, that they're infected with something that's 10 years old. <laughs> Again, I, uh, you know, I thought that it would be a dead botnet and that it would just be a fun exercise, but it turns out that these worms really do never die. Uh, just like Carson said in his video, um, these things are around forever and there's almost no way to get rid of them, right? As long as there's a vulnerable host, which is gonna run that auto run from USB key, uh, this is gonna continue to spread. So basically, I'm gonna kill this now. Uh, so basically, that's in a nutshell, that's how to set up a sinkhole. And again, I encourage you, if you haven't watched the other videos that led up to this, to go check them out. Uh, I, again, I'll link them all below. If you're interested in the reverse engineering process. I've tried to show all, all the different parts of it. And I think it's this is probably one of the better tutorial series we've done because I feel like this really shows uh, all of the grinding really that leads up to a moment like this, which is kind of cool. So you might see people talking about how they sink hold something. Of course, WannaCry being the famous uh, example where that ransomware was stopped. But there's, it's not just as simple as registering a domain. Um, there's quite a bit of work that goes into it beforehand. And uh, hopefully I've showed you not just uh, how much work, but how you can do it too, uh, if you want to. I put the sample down below. Uh, I've linked it if you, in case you guys want to take a look at it. And again, in those other videos, uh, we give you pretty much a step-by-step -step of how we reverse engineered it. And we've left some scripts for you in those videos that can help you uh, sort of work through it yourselves. So that's it. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I think we probably will do another uh, long form tutorial series like this. We have a few other interesting things coming up, so stay tuned for that. And until next time, keep exposing the mechanics behind the malware. Stay curious. Well, I got 545 and it's 545. Gotta get a whopper and a 40 ride. Yeah, you know you fucking feel me. Yeah, you know you fucking feel me. Yeah, you know you fucking feel me.